And now, without further ado, Jim Holyoke and Matt Shane. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. I, I first just wanted to thank Brianna for um, all of the work that you've done here. It's uh, actually incredible um, how much you've done, and also to the rest of the staff at Open Space. Um, you've been so accommodating to us, and we keep pushing back the hours further and further every night as we get more frantic to get work done. So sorry that we're not always on time at from the one till two uh, artist meet and greet time. <laughs> Um, but uh, we're really, really happy to have the opportunity to do this project. As Brianna mentioned, we, uh, we met here at UVic in 1999, um, and since then we've lived in a bunch of different places and done a lot of different work that um, is along the same lines as the work that we started here in Victoria. So it's really exciting for us to be able to circle back um, to Victoria, to this place that really means a lot to us. Um, the, whose landscape figures heavily into both of our uh, memories and imaginations. Um, and so, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so um, the work that we'll begin showing you are some of the highlights from our, our last 20 years of collaborating. Uh, not all of them, just a, a few of them. We'll zoom through those and then end up at, at our current project. And there'll be about 15 minutes, hopefully, for a question and answer afterwards. Yeah. Also, if you have like a burning question that you just have to ask, go for it. Yeah, you can just yell at us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, my friend Matt Shane was uh, uh, born in Vancouver and grew up in Tawasson, BC. And my friend Jim Holyoke was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan and grew up in Aldergrove, BC. Yeah. And we met in uh, Conrad Kordowski's uh, Drawing 100 class at UVic back in 1999. Uh, neither Matt or I knew at the point that we'd do, be doing this still, or be doing anything like this. Uh, here's a drawing that we made of ourselves as zombies back when we were making friends. After one year at UVic uh, in, in art, we, we decided to drop out and travel across Asia together. So we did a big trip overland from Thailand to India, across China and Tibet. A lot of hitchhiking. Um, this is uh, a photo of us looking really young, um, <laughs> in Tibet on a boat. Um, and th during that trip, I guess at the time, I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer. That was kind of my dream. I just wanted to be able to travel and make art. When I looked into the future, that's what I really wanted to see. And I feel very privileged to say that I've had the opportunity to do a lot of both of those things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those things with my buddy Jim. Mm -hmm. Um, that's something that we didn't really know that we could do. Mm -hmm. um, travel opened us up to, um, we were exposed to so many different ways of living um, and that kind of broadened uh, our view of what, what a life could look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, growing up in Aldergrove, BC, there's not an extremely diverse uh, spectrum of uh, beliefs and things. So <laughs> I, I at the, when I was a young, really young guy, I really struggled with uh, thoughts to do with spirituality, for instance. and. Uh, traveling for most of a year in Asia was really a, almost a healing process for me to see that, yes, indeed, there is an enormous sp spectrum of ways to live and things that one can believe in. Anyhow, after finishing uh, this big trip, we returned to Victoria and moved in together at this place at 2927 Cedar Hill Road, where we lived for three years in the basement of this place. The downstairs was called the down, that was our home, and the upstairs was called the up, not to be confused, it was like a, a country away from us. Different places. Totally different place. Uh, this drawing kind of describes me and Matt's early uh, drawing relationship where I would draw giant beasts destroying the architecture that he would draw. Meticulously. Um, so the, the first uh, major installation we did in this vein was called the Utopic Dream of the Sun in a Box. And we covered all the walls of our basement suite with paper and drew on the walls for about a year. We weren't really framing this as an art project at the time. It was more like a way of inhabiting our drawings. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were going to sleep in the drawing, waking up in the drawing, writing down your dream on the walls. It was a drawing wall, a graffiti wall. Anybody could come and draw with us. Um, and it was full of traces of our lived experience as well. There was uh, tomato sauce spatters all over the walls. One time somebody dropped the portable deep fryer and there was a huge oil stain all over the place. <laughs> Banana slugs got into the bathroom and were chewing away at the paper. It nearly burnt down three times. There was fungus, um, lots of stuff. The landlords really didn't like it. Yeah, so and then, dating the picture, you can see our third roommate, Fike, there uh, on a phone with a phone book. 
Uh, yeah, that's in the living room. Here's the view out of my bedroom. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the living room. Yeah, and this is the bathroom. Bathrooms often collect graffiti, and once we sort of encourage that process, whoa, the, the bathroom was a crazy place. And there was blood all over the walls in one spot. Yeah, <laughs> anyways, don't need to go there. This is our kitchen. Uh, there, that's where the spaghetti splatter would be. And at the back here, you'll see what's uh, the dungeon door. That door led to a room with no windows, which was our jam space when we played in a band. Um, our band was called Mammal. So there we are. There's Matt on the drums and me up front. We just found this picture yesterday, and we're very excited to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, completing this project in, in Victoria, as Matt was saying, um, we didn't even think of it as an art project, drawing on the walls like this. It was just an experiment. It was actually our uh, undergrad advisor, Linda Gammon, who had... Um, suggested that we apply for a grant to re-show our work elsewhere. And so we did, and we actually got the grant. It was our first ever artist grant, and we applied to re-show the utopic dream of the sun in a box in Montreal, where we moved and ended up living there for over a decade, basically based in Montreal from, from then on. Yeah, we didn't really see it coming. We thought we were going to do this exhibition, and then we kind of fell in love with the city, so we yeah. ended up staying. We couldn't get a gallery to exhibit the show on such short notice, so we got a loft space in St. Henry and kind of made our own gallery where we also lived. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and with the money that we had, we constructed this labyrinth of walls throughout the space, and then we covered the walls with the drawings um, from Victoria. So in a way, it was like transporting our old home with these walls and these drawings that we were so intimate with to our new home in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And there was something very comforting about bringing our space with us to this new place. Here you can see the dungeon door at the end of this long corridor. Uh, playing with our, uh, rearranging the architecture in this way was really fun. It makes it quite different than um, a normal experience of looking at a painting, for instance. Uh, this would require you to get up really close, to look up, to look down, and the drawing changes. And hopefully would, you would travel with your eyes through this maze of information. And travel physically as well. I think the sense of immersion is always something that's been important to us in the work. Um, both uh, being immersed in the drawing and also um, the sense of mental immersion that goes into making these pieces. Um, feeling like we really want to be spending as much time as we can living in the drawing. And the kinds of thoughts that arise in that environment are quite different from if you're just working on a single piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And by living in the drawing, you actually fall asleep in the drawing, you wake up in the drawing, you look at it with the lights on and off, and it causes that, speaking of the brain or the forestrial mind, there's a, an unconscious mind and a, this intuitive mind that we would have both the intentional drawing and all this other kind of chance activity. Um, so while we stayed in Montreal, we also did our master's degrees together at Concordia University. I started a year ahead of Matt, uh, and uh, this project at the Articule Artist Run Center is where we did a project called Grayscale Rainbow. Matt was in his first year of his uh, master's degree, and I'm my second. So there, we lived on site in the Artist Run Center. Um, we slept on the floor and ate off of hot plates for a month. Here's Matt papering the walls, which is a preliminary step in most of our projects. Uh, you can see from this triangular corner, that's your landmark, to this spot here where a month later it's completely dense. So we had tables filled with all the different kinds of grayscale materials that we could find. Gesso, charcoal, ink especially. And everyone who came into the gallery was invited to draw with us. People would ask us what we were doing and we would just pass them a brush and say, you're welcome to draw too. And if they said, I can't draw, they said, don't worry about it, it's okay. And they're like, well, what if we make a mess? What if we wreck it? Worst case scenario, it'll be painted over again. Even if you make a good drawing, it'll be painted over again. Uh, so here's Matt living, uh, sleeping on the floor and eating his favorite meal, pasta. And here we are uh, simultaneously levitating over our beds. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so groups of children came in here, little kids, like four years old, who draw really differently than, uh, than others. Um, there was... Uh, university groups, uh, wandering drunk people, all kinds of different things. But because Matt and I lived in the gallery over the month, of course, we had a lot more control than anyone else. And we thought of it as our job to make all the little drawings interconnect into one giant room-sized artwork. This is a piece we did uh, a couple years after that at the Banff Center in the Walter Phillips Other Gallery. 
And this was the most chaotic installation we've ever done. It was, we worked with uh, over 200 children, and mostly they were coming in packs of 20 as, as classes or daycares, um, and they would have about an hour at a time to draw. So um, we didn't really put any rules or regulations in place, which was maybe not the best idea. And then usually what would happen is one kid would discover that you could fill up a sponge with paint and throw it at the wall, and it would just make a huge splatter. And then all the kids wanted to do that. So it was really hard to control the drawing. We got most of our, our drawing done at night and up high where nobody could reach. It, um, it was a lot like building sandcastles for little kids to destroy. We'd be up till four in the morning drawing and show up in the morning with huge bags under eyes, and everything we'd done the night before would be obliterated in minutes. It was like a hybrid of an art class and PE. And there's Matt cleaning up. Yeah, so I think people often ask us if the process of doing these installations is more important than the final drawings. And the truth is, the process is very important to us. And we like to be able to showcase that throughout the exhibition. But also the final drawing is important to us. We want to be able to stand back at the end, see moments of chance, moments of intention, and to really want to look at the drawing for a long time. We want to make the best drawing we can. Uh, this drawing got a little too out of hand for us, and we kind of decided that from there on out, we would either work just the two of us or with a select group of people. Right. It's kind of the difference between a noisy cacophony and playing a song. It takes practice to collaborate well, uh, to not just feel like you're shouting over each other, but to have a conversation. Yeah, and it feels like you're creating a language together instead of shouting at each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> So the next project we'll show you is called Quagmire, um, which was exhibited at the Musée d'Art Contemporain for the uh, um, Quebec Triennial in 2011 in Montreal. So for this, Matt and I made a giant gallery-sized depiction of a swamp, and we made it on site in the museum uh, over the course of four months. So we worked uh, about eight hours a night, five days a week for four months. Um, we worked during the hours the museum was closed. So we would show up at 6 p.m. and work until 2 a.m. And so we felt a little bit like elves, the people that would come back and they'd see that things have been changed around, but they wouldn't see us. Just the security guards were our pals in there. So the museum made for a really fun studio. Um, but anyhow, about quagmire, uh, uh, the def definition of a quagmire is either a swamp or a big problem. Um, our depiction of this space, uh, we were really inspired by the Carboniferous period of natural history, which was about 340 million years ago. So that's where all, it's also called the coal age. All the coal that we burn comes from the fossilized remains of fern forests, and our oil comes from the coral reefs and plankton at that time. So when people talk about you know, fossil fuels coming from dinosaurs. Actually, it's way older than that, even before dinosaurs evolved. So thinking about extremely deep time, this is when the first amphibians were uh, colonizing the land, and the, and the world was basically ruled by giant insects, uh, dragonflies with meter-wide wingspans. So sort of the centerpiece of this drawing was actually inspired by a photograph of a dead sperm whale that our friend photographed in uh, Newfoundland. So here you can see the body of a giant whale, its mouth barfing out all of these guts, and its eye has been turned into an open pit mine. And as you step up closer, you'll realize that the body of the whale is also a landscape where cities crawl across it like barnacles, probably unaware of what they are actually built on. And at the end of this project, uh, we had a finissage where we dressed up as swamp creatures. And yeah, there we are. We, uh, we often get asked the question, what do you do with your drawing installations after they're finished? Because um, we put so much work into them, and they're also fit to the architecture of where they're being displayed. We usually just pop out all the staples, and they actually um, roll up quite nicely into a tube. And usually the tubes end up at a, a storage space in a studio on Salt Spring Island where Jim's dad has a place. But on this one particular occasion, we were able to re-exhibit a portion of quagmire in the Netherlands at a museum called the Gem Museum, G-E-M, as part of a show called Yes Naturally. So um, we brought out this, this piece of the drawing, and then for a month we worked on site at the museum. Oh, by the way, that's a, the piece in front of the drawing is by Mark Dion. That's a coyote that he did, taxidermy coyote. 
Uh, for a month, we, we, cut out, uh, we drew and cut out foliage, tree trunks, um, root systems, salal, fungus, all this kind of stuff. And then we flooded it with ink on the floor, and then we attached it to the walls, collaging over the existing drawing to make a site of rapid growth. So it felt like the drawing was almost being strangled by all of these new drawings that were being attached to it. And it felt like it could go on like that forever. And these rubberized floors in the museum were really handy because we were using uh, surgical scalpels as drawing tools for our first time. Yeah. yeah, so there we are looking as tough as we can while holding hands. <laughs> Next project I want to tell you about is uh, called Six Ghosts Spelled Unknown Alphabet. So after I finished grad school, I spent about six months attending artist residencies across Norway. And at one of them, a Nordic Artist Center, I made friends with an artist from Trondheim named Catherine Dahl. And we used to, used to stay up late making collaborative drawings together, playing this like, classic surrealist corpse game and broken telephone. And while we were doing that, we came up with a, a phrase through a broken tele, telephone type game six ghosts spell unknown alphabet. And that seemed like such a good name for a title. What kind of art show could we make out of that? We decided to contact some other artists, so there would be six of us. And then since we all lived in different places, we would correspond through the post. So over about one year, we mailed giant bundles of half-finished drawings between nine different cities and several different countries and then had a rendezvous in Oslo at the Tenja Forbundet, which is the um, drawing center of, of Norway, and uh, hung all our work together, made more of them. I think that this, this, drawing, this project was really playful. There's one of our envelopes. A lot of the drawings that we made were pretty, pretty silly. Um, sometimes we would uh, make, make a drawing that we quite liked, but it wasn't quite just wasn't quite there yet. We put a lot of care into it, but we'd mail it to somebody and it'd come back all cut to pieces and glued back together and then it would go a step farther it needed to become somewhat interesting. Uh, yeah, so there's the six ghosts at the closing there. This is a piece we did called A Hole in the World. Um, this is the first permanent installation we've done together and it's at a building called the American Can Building in Montreal through a, a group called Arden Buildings. And so we were given a huge amount of space in the corridor of this commercial building and uh, we decided to make a huge drawing that was centered around this giant black hole. So we had to make it in three parts in the studio, that kind of gives you an idea of the scale. And we started by just flooding the, the middle of the drawing with ink and then it dried in this way that kind of suggested uh, what we decided was a bone forest. And then on either side of the hole, there was these two peninsulas coming in that were like negative space that we <coughs> drew in uh, landforms and architecture and a landscape. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a landscape that was kind of crumbling and melting away, kind of like an iceberg in a way. Yeah, it, uh, the, the black and white negative positive reversal is kind of referred to oil and ice or maybe even just a pit and, and, a, and, a sa and sand that's kind of um, crumbling and spilling apart. Yeah. Last summer was a crazy time. We had three collaborative month-long projects in a row, um, July, August, and September. So we spent July at, uh, in, the, in the Laurentians, in the forest just north of Montreal, at this cabin in the woods where there's a sculpture garden through the forest where you can travel through on cross-country skis in the, in, the, in the winter. And depending on the seat, of course, Quebec has really different four seasons. And every season, the whole forest looks different, and so the artwork looks different, too. So we were basically given carte blanche at this, at this cabin to transform it. And uh, we covered the exterior in birdhouses and then burnt drawings into the interior with pyrography pens. The title, hibernacula, is again a biology term referring to the kind of sanctuary spaces where animals hibernate and, uh, to keep safe. That includes like insects that survive through the winter hiding out. So basically a house for small animals. And inside the house, we drew more houses, and we also drew the forest from outside. Um, and with these pyrography pens, there's no electricity there, so we had to bring in a generator to power our tools. And then at, after we'd turn it off, the lights would go out, and the forest was filled with fireflies and croaking frogs and moths and mosquitoes all over the glass. And our, and our, our little house would be full of smoke. Yeah, so we decided to draw a lot of the creatures that lived in the forest and make all of these depictions of houses on the interior of a house. We're thinking about 
the inside and outside as a profoundly environmental concept and how the forest, while it's a place that's outside, is also a place that's inside. You enter the forest and are immersed within it. And it's also kind of an architectural space, although it's grown and not built. You have to navigate between all of these trees, finding your path. And, you know, thinking of homes within homes. Right. Right, and how even our minds are a home for our thoughts, so that even the imagination connects to a greater sense of ecology. So these are our neighbors there. <laughs> and right after that project, uh, we went to a very different environment in northern Iceland, uh, in a very small village called Hjaltari. It was a village of about 35 people, um, and we did this project in a, what used to be Europe's largest herring factory. It's now been converted into an art space, although there's almost no infrastructure in it. It's still a pretty raw space. There's no running water or heat, and there's not that much electricity, and there was no cooking supplies at all when we arrived there. We had to go out and buy all that stuff. There was 11 people exhibiting in this show, but there was only eight of us that could actually make it out there. And we were there for about a month. A big part of the challenge of, of working there was just sustaining life and health for that amount of time. It was also really cold and it stank like herring. Um, it was pretty, kind of an awful place to be in the summer, actually. Well, the, um, but also an incredible opportunity to transform this gigantic space that was like the size of three or four hockey arenas put together. It was a really spooky place, yeah. And then we'd go back to Reykjavik feeling like barbarians reeking of dead fish. Um, so we did a huge mural across the um, giant chambers here with stencils of herring. And so we, we were spraying ink the whole way across, getting headaches from blowing all this ink through atomizers the whole way. And Jim also made this, um, this giant silhouette of a basking shark that's about life size. At night, we would usually uh, play music. I'm a drummer. and. Christine, my friend Christine was playing bass and Nick Kipper was playing guitar and uh, we would just jam into the night. The neighbors didn't really care. But also it was such an amazing place to play the drums because I've never played in a room that size before and you just hit the kick drum and it booms and echoes throughout the whole building. And was, the whole village actually. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um, so that was a big part of, like, improvisation was a big part of this project. We came to it with different specialties, different mediums, and we found a way to make art together. Excuse me, is that an ongoing art show? Does it attract more economy for tourists to the village, or what was the purpose? Well, I mean, the, the purpose was to do an art show. Um, it, it is an art gallery, so they, you know, they asked us to come and do the show. It, it, I mean, it did bring some people to that small village as well. It's kind of near another town called Akureyri, and that's the second largest city in Iceland. Still very small, but some people would come over from Akureyri. There were tourists coming through as well. So, yeah, people did come to the factory to actually see the work in progress. Yeah. It's a good question, though, because uh, it's in such a remote location. Um, very few people saw this project and all the work that we put into it. It's run by just one, uh, it's run by a couple. They handle the whole thing. And the, and the building is in it. It's, it's actually a kind of a death trap. There's holes everywhere you can fall through. Uh, that kind of thing would just probably not fly in Canada because it's, it's so sketchy. Um, but we, we uh, worked with uh, some audio and video artists also who did a good job recording and documenting um, the whole process. And there's a documentary in the works now uh, so hopefully within the next year or so that will come out online and then a bigger audience would actually see the project. Yeah, so that was a year ago now, actually, that we were in Iceland. And then we returned to Montreal where we'd been asked to do another project at the Musée d'Art Contemporain. And we were offered this space, which is on the second floor of the Museum uh, Rotunda. And we were given the month of September to create a, an in situ permanent work, painting directly onto the walls with black ink. It was a really challenging space architecturally because of these giant gaps that these vertical windows make along about 60-something feet of usable space, about 14 feet tall. And we decided to uh, do a project called Wadwo. Um, a Wadwo is a, a mythological forest being from the UK. Uh, we learned about this from a Ted Hughes poem, uh, who was the poet laureate of, 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 the, of Great Britain. In his poem, 
the Wadwo is sitting by a stream, looking around it and at his own body and asking himself, what am I? What am I? And what am I doing here? And we're thinking about this as sort of an environmental question also. Each of us is part of the world, and also by looking at it from the outside, we, there's a sense of separation, this strange feeling. And we're really interested in, in forests around the world. There almost always seems to be some kind of legend of a mysterious, under, little understood being that lives out there. Here in British Columbia, of course, it's the Sasquatch. And so these creatures that we made, we made two Sasquatches kind of lumbering across. And if you step up close, you can't really tell the legs off and, and the arms from the shaggy, furry foliage of this drooling moss off of the trees. Yeah, so here we are at work, and here's the face of one of the Wadwos afterwards. We're also quite interested in the idea of trolls that we learned about from Norway, where uh, there's woodland trolls that are like trees that come to life at night, and there's stone trolls that have been fossilized if exposed by sunlight. Yeah, yeah so trolls are both animated creatures and also landscapes at the same time. Yeah. So as we mentioned before, I think, um, our collaborative work isn't all we do. We um, each have solo practices as well. And in fact, we spend a lot more time working on our own work than we do collaboratively. We usually just come together once a year to do a big work together. Mm -hmm. So on my own time, I, um, I mostly do paintings. Um, I work with oils and also with watercolors. Um, I do a lot of work in plein air, and I also uh, make these gigantic paintings that are landscapes found at the border between wilderness and civilization. They're often full of human effects, human artifacts. They're landscapes of exploitation, but there's no humans present in these worlds. They're worlds of abandonment. I also work with paint differently from how I work with ink. Um, often the paint is really thick, and often I'm kind of building up structures and then letting them disintegrate as well. There's a sense of melting. And I've done a lot of residencies. Both Jim and I have always do a lot of traveling that way. Um, I did a residency in Dubai for three and a half months and was mostly drawing what was around me, going out to gravel parking lots and drawing the buildings that were being constructed. And a lot of them were halfway through construction when they were abandoned um, because of the economic recession. So there was all these half-built structures all over the place. The whole city seemed like a giant experiment that it was hard to tell if it was going to actually flourish or not. It was hard to tell how well it was doing. The other uh, major collaborative project I have is my old band, Think About Life. I played in bands for years and years. This was the most significant one. And it was a three-piece in Montreal. Uh, we did a lot of touring around North America, Europe, and Japan. And we put out a couple of albums. And uh, we are actually playing a reunion show in about a month in, at Pop Montreal. So I'm really excited for that. All right. Now to show you a little bit of, of my uh, solo work, um, the two poles of my work are basically large-scale drawing installations and books, <coughs> drawing and writing. I've always been drawing my whole life. Uh, I, I was learning to draw before I could write, really. It was a way, a way of telling stories. Uh, while I was a, a, a kid and a teenager, I would draw with pencils mainly. I never really used colored materials. But then when I got to UVic, or sorry, when I got to UVic, yes, I began using ink, uh, wet materials to draw, which I hadn't really used before, um, and became more and more interested in the uh, traditional ways that ink has been used in art. And on the same trip that Matt and I took across Asia back in uh, 2001, um, we, we met a man named Sunling Xiang, who became, there he is, uh, my ink painting teacher. About seven years after that, I returned to China and spent two months studying with Sunling Xiang. We painted together for nine hours a day, seven days a week for two months. So here he is up on a rooftop, and this is one of his paintings there. He's famous in China for being a master of nightscapes, or nocturnes, which I was also deeply interested in with this black and white emphasis, at looking at drawings that aren't just high contrast black, white, but the spectrum of grays, the very low contrast dark on dark or light on light, like snowscapes and nightscapes. I chose to show this photo, or image, painting, ink painting, because I made it plein air in a dried up riverbed. This place is called Sinpin, is on the back of the 20 yuan bill. There's a, a cave here, which is your, uh, your point of reference, because here it is again. 
Notice these amazing karst mountains are even over vertical, leaning. So the place is like a, it did look like a fairy tale. Sometimes it's a, it's a really rainy, foggy area where the mountains seem to levitate, just like a Chinese ink painting. This is a, where I did my thesis project in, in Montreal in the Faculty of Fine Arts Gallery. They have a long vitrine. It's about 135 feet long. And I spent a month living inside the, tra- the vitrine like a terrarium. I was like the, the mammal scurrying around in there drawing. Uh, all my life I've been really interested in animals, especially extinct animals like dinosaurs and also monsters. And all of these, I think, looking at animals inevitably causes one to look at yourself over again. Look at your hand that's making these drawings of a tree, realizing that it involved actually climbing trees and the dexterity that came from that forest habitat, our old home, is now what we use to do all the different things that people do. This project, Holocene, is in reference to the most recent period of of, uh, geologic time, the last 12,000 years following the Pleistocene. Uh, In recent years, it's been more commonly termed the Anthropocene, actually, more recently, from when people started burning fossil fuels, nuclear energy, the invention of plastic, and all the changes that are happening on Earth as defines the Anthropocene. And the Holocene Anthropocene is defined by climate change and also mass extinction. So the sixth mass extinction is, um, the fifth was the, the end of the dinosaur 65 million years ago. And now it's happening again. And so this was my way of reflecting on that, drawing extinct, endangered, and imaginary animals through the walls. And people sent in postcards to also reflect on this, while I had hanging in the glass. And this is uh, about half of a book that I've now finished uh, called um, The Book of 19 Nocturnes. It's a giant novel about a woman made of wood who's lost in a forest where the sun never rises. And she wanders around having conversations with monsters and creating weird creatures with the moss and the, the wood and the materials she finds and falling asleep and dreaming. So the whole story is about wandering and um, imagining. Uh, so that's, that's just, just exhibited in Montreal, the final version, and, and is going to Latvia in a, about a month. So that brings us to the current project, Forestrial Brain, which is something we've been working on since July 1st, technically. So there's kind of two components to this project. The first was um, hiking the West Coast Trail. So the two of us went to Banfield and hiked down to Port Renfrew along that trail. It's a 75-kilometer trail. And yeah, it was my first time doing the trail. Jim's done it a couple times in the past. And then we were making sketches while we were out there and taking notes and taking photos. And then we came back here to open space, covered all the walls with paper, and now we're making one continuous drawing. It's based on our experience of hiking the trail. In some ways, it it, uh, reflects actual places that we saw. And then it's also an imaginary world. (coughs) It's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. We're pulling out different things from each other as well. Right, so the drawing is a, in here is a mixture of the observed, all the, the hallway there, the stairwell is full of drawings that we made in the field hiking. But in here, it's the imagined, the observed, and the remembered. Uh, it's all blurring together. And it's our shared imaginary world, yeah. Um, so in addition to eight days on the trail, we spent uh, two days in Banfield. Uh, thanks, Brianna, for uh, setting this up where we went on a field trip uh, with some marine uh, marine biologists to collect plankton samples to observe under microscopes. We wanted to do this partly because just off the shore there's a kelp forest, which is a different kind of forest we wanted to think about. And also this hydrosphere that you know, it's pressed against our atmosphere, is the home to, of course, the BC is famous for orcas and sea otters and things, but if you look into, these, into the plankton, nobody or few people really understand or look at these creatures because they're too small to see. Um, this is a video that won't work here, but this creature here is a giant Pacific octopus. There's Matt Stone for reference. You can see how small it is, but under a microscope, you can actually see its multiple hearts beating. Some of these creatures, like crab larvae, were really amazing to look at because they don't look like crabs. It was like finding a whole bunch of aliens that were living in the backyard. They're completely different. So since then, we've been uh, collecting books from the 
marine biology department of the library and looking at these little creatures which may start entering into the walls. And so, yeah, a lot of these creatures which are microscopic and invisible to, to the naked eye are responsible for most of the oxygen that we breathe. They're intimately connected mm -hmm. with our world, but right. we just don't see them, and yeah. so we don't acknowledge them. We're looking at diatoms, where about 80% of our oxygen comes from these microscopic plants. They're too small to see, but under a microscope, they have these architectural uh, forms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the two major um, sort of landscapes that are part of the West Coast Trail are the coastline and beach, and then um, and that's kind of an open and expansive place. We usually, pretty much every campsite is on the beach, so we're always sleeping at the like under the stars, and you can see the sunset because it's always facing west. And then you're entering the forest, and the forest is kind of the opposite of that. It's an enclosed space, and it's full of all this biomass and all this stimulus. There's so much to look at, these root systems, trees, all this carbon, basically. And we're often stopping and drawing along the trail and spooking out other hikers as they were coming towards us, thinking we were a bear. So some really hardcore hikers will do this in five days. It average takes about a week. We took eight days so that we could take it as slow as we could. If we saw something interesting, we would just sit down and draw it. It was no rush. We're um, often separating on the trail, too. We walk at different paces. We, different things catch our eyes, and so we would just meet up at the campsite at the end. Right. Well, I want to show you a couple of photos of the trail itself, because you're thinking of the, of the shore and of the forest, but actually architecture is, and the path itself is a really important part of the experience hiking the West Coast Trail. This mud here is about almost knee deep. Um, it's a really tough hike. Oftentimes you're climbing, so it's 75 kilometers as a bird flies, but it's actually much longer because you travel like this. You go up a ladder to another ladder, cross and down a ladder to another ladder. This suspension bridge was about one foot wide. You can't take a dog for a walk on this hike. You need to have hands. It's really a, a biped thing you need to do. Here's a picture of, uh, of me drawing on a stream. And here's Matt Shane at uh, Susiat Falls. We took a day off at this place, Susiat Falls, and swam in the falls and did a lot of drawing there as well. That was probably the best day. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then some of the drawings that we made on the trail, they're all um, in the stairwell there, but some of them we would use directly as reference material for the drawing we're doing here. Um, for instance, that drawing on the right there can, was the basis for this tree here, which is actually kind of like a nurse stump. It was like a, a stump that was growing two new trees out of it, which is something that, that trees often do. They, after they're cut down, they'll leach their nutrients into new trees. The, the idea that, yeah. of uh, frustral brain came from a lot of reading that I've been doing. There's a book called The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollebin, which talks a lot about trees as being a lot more complicated than we think of them. They're not these static, inert creatures. They're, they actually behave as communities, um, and they're able to transfer nutrients to each other in underground networks of fungus, sometimes between different species as well. Like a maple could give nutrients to an oak tree that might be many, many meters away. And this is all research that's just coming to light now. We're learning more about it. There's a researcher named uh, Suzanne Samard at UBC who's actually uncovering a lot of this information. And a lot of Peter Volibin's book was based on her research. So, so while a network of roots isn't exactly the same as the network of neurons and synapses in, our, in a brain, it is vaguely parallel in the way that one area can communicate with another area. So I wanted to show just a few pictures from things we saw on the trail that would trigger our ideas. Um, this giant stack of stones on the beach, I thought it looked like a, like a sphinx. You can almost see its nose on eyebrow and lips and hair growing on top. Some of these rocks on the beach, I would think they look like a giant banana slug, but growing, growing fur of uh, trees on its back. Sometimes the same rock I'd think is a slug. Matt would think it looks like a fossilized sailboat. So when I'd see something that looks like it's in a state of transforming into something else, I would draw it. And in here, too, we're trying to create a sense that kelp can turn to architecture, can turn to wood, can turn to stone, and all of these different kinds of forces and elements are blending into one another and in a state of flux. And that's reflected in the materials that we use as well. We sometimes use solids like charcoal, mm -hmm. and sometimes use liquids like ink, and then sometimes we're spraying water, which is more like a gas. Mm -hmm. 
here's a banana slug, the second biggest species of slug on Earth, um, but still pretty small compared to the trees that they live in. Uh, walking into a, a giant forest like on the West Coast Trail, I, I think of it as like an Alice in Wonderland experience where you, 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 for a moment you're, it doesn't, you're not quite sure if the trees just got big or if you just got really small. And I love this feeling of uh, looking at things with, uh, in these different senses of scale, both in size but also in time. When you walk past a tree that's hundreds or a thousand years old, you can't help but be kind of amazed and wonder, what has it seen? What else has happened underneath it over that time? And try to, try, of course, we can't know what it's like to be a tree, but I think there's still something valuable in imagining it. When I'd get down on my knees to draw one of these slugs and look at it carefully, I would start noticing these tiny little insects crawling all over the slug, and then realize that this creature was not just a, a figure in the landscape, but all, I mean, it's a landscape itself for even littler creatures. And yeah, here's a final photo of us drawing at the campsite. Such a relaxing thing to do after a day of hiking. Um, we just kind of lean against a stump or a log and, and draw what was in front of us. Drawing is a way of thinking. It's actually, I, I relate the pace of drawing to the pace of walking, which I also relate to the pace of thinking. It's a comfortable pace to pull out thoughts. It's very different from checking your phone all the time or being on the internet, which is more fragmentary. This is kind of like pulling on a thread from the inside to the outside. And when things are really flowing, it feels like there is no inside or outside. It's more like the drawing tells you what to do. It's all kind of coming from outside of you. Mm -hmm. I feel that especially when I'm drawing observationally, it feels like what I'm seeing is directly translated through my hand onto the page. And there's not, it doesn't feel like a, like a struggle. It feels more like channeling something. I think this is, this is the, uh, an important difference with this project from earlier ones. Is this is the first time we've connected an outside place and physically traveling, the experience of traveling, to what, we, uh, what happens here in the gallery. And we're thinking that traveling around the room with our hands is kind of analogous to traveling through a forest on your feet, especially a tricky path like this one. It requires a degree of balance where you have to focus your attention in a way to not wipe out. Also, this, this, uh, working in this way is like a journey. There's a start date and an end date. We have fixed parameters. We know how much space we have, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen within those parameters. And that's always the, the funnest part is not just leading towards this destination, but it's finding all of these new connections that come out along the way. So yeah, that's our, here's our last slide of us like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, 20 years after making friends. A little and, older, a little gnarlier. Yeah, a little balder. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, anyhow, um, now we've got about uh, 17 minutes for questions. Um, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, I'm curious about the collaboration mm. and if, if, there, if you have different hands, mm. if you make different marks. Mm -hmm. I noticed that one of you is left handed and one of you is right handed. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering if that works in. Mm -hmm. But I can't distinguish one hand mm -hmm. from another. Do you intentionally do that? Do you have different hands? Mm -hmm. Just talk about that if you it's, a, it's an interesting comment, and it's funny that you notice that we're left-handed and right-handed. But um, yeah, I, I think we do definitely have different hands and, and different brains. And uh, often at the planning stage is where there's the most friction between us, because we're trying to communicate these ideas in words about how the drawing is going to work. And it's impossible to, to do that. But I do find that when we actually get down to drawing, our hands somehow come together and make a continuous space that it, it, often it's, it's difficult for us to tell who did which marks. Part of that is just that we've been working together for so long too. We have a lot of the same visual strategies. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's often surprising to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, you can see it in handwriting a lot. Everybody writes differently. Um, you don't have to be good at handwriting to handwrite, you know, and it, yeah, often what's interesting isn't how skillful it is, but how much character there is in it. So Matt and I have very different handwriting, and yeah, in fact, because he's left-handed and I'm right-handed, we sometimes will stand on the what sides, so we don't smash into each other, you know, to give each other a little room. And also, I was thinking that it is like musicians. When you're playing with another musician for the first time, you're trying to find to play the right key, to be on the same 
pace, but after you've been practicing for years and years, you can just jump into a conversation with another musician immediately. And I think that sometimes our collaborative work is especially interesting because of this doubling of methods to deal with it. Uh, it becomes more rich in a variety of textures and lines. We intentionally switch places all the time. So if I feel like I've put too much energy into some place, I'll back off and just wait for Matt to do it. And once he leaves his spot, I'll take over where, where he left off. So that every area often has two layers of drawing. Well, you know, two, two different people's layers. Sometimes we'll have 10 layers of drawing as we repeat the process over and over. We do have certain kind of specialties as yeah. well. I tend to focus more on architecture. Mm. So if there's like a ladder or something like that that I want to put in, mm. and Jim might say, hey, can you do that here? Mm. And Jim often works on creatures yeah. and fur. Yeah. Um, and so he'll, he'll kind of look after those areas. Yeah. Matt drew a spider in that web, and I didn't like it. So I turned it into a crab in a web, yeah. <laughs> for instance. Yeah. So do you work actually, I'll just be greedy, one more question. Like say something like that behind you. Is that you, both of you? Yeah. Like, are you working together? Or do you sort of move along together? And we're not usually in the same place when we're drawing. Oh. It's usually like, like I might be over here and Jim might be over here. But then at a certain point, we kind of stand back and think, all right, that's looking pretty, Jim. And then, so I'll go and work in that area and he'll work in my area. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, decide where everything's going to go? Do you build the whole design before you set out? It's, it's a mixture. Yeah, yeah, we'll do some, sometimes we'll have a, a little strip of long paper and kind of pretend it's enlarged into a wall and just sort of map out a composition. And that's where we might have an argument, like uh, he, Matt envisions something differently than I do, but then we come up with some kind of compromise or a new idea that we both like. But then we kind of fill in spots and then the work is to connect them, to create the in-betweens. Almost again like a uh, surrealist game where you have to connect one drawing to another with a new drawing between them. But so we, when this is finished, is it going to be filled right up? Hopefully, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if we have time. <laughs> we have two more weeks to work on the project. So we'll do as much as we can within that time. But yeah, often we do start with pencil, like kind of map in the, a few of the details with pencil. You can see like over here, like we'll, we'll ink that in afterwards. Um, but we're also still going to be planning, like, you know, even after that's all inked in, we'll probably want to do some stuff up in the sky over there with pencil first. So it's not like one big plan, fill in the plan. It's like a mixture of things. So I'm just wondering, like, how many kind of layers might there be between, you know, at least when it's finished, like, on, say, that, that leaf mass there? Yeah. I think there's four or five on this so far, and it's not done. Yeah, but it depends. Some areas are really thin. We intentionally try to create like a sort of ethereal, gassy kind of places where the drawing is dissolving. It's evaporating or melting into a much more abstract uh, area. And other places where it crystallizes into something really graphic and uh, detailed and has more volume. So, you know, and, and even to have some empty space, some negative space that can still move in to the, so we're not just following black lines everywhere, but white spaces in between it all to create this kind of feeling of an entanglement, of a mesh of lines connected to other areas. Yeah. There is a rhythm to it as well. I think we're often, you know, getting up close and working on these little details meticulously, but then there's, you have to stand back from it often and look at the overall composition and kind of ask it what it needs. Like the logic of the drawing takes over after a certain point. We don't want to lose all of our white space. Yeah, when you're walking along, are you, do you develop a sense of what you're going to leave out? Because I'm conscious here of what is left out as much as what is put in. And the forest is incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. So your brain must focus in on some things and mm -hmm. have a, some set of criteria for mm -hmm. Uh, saying this is in, that is out. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, that's really Good difficult, yeah. in fact, because we come back with plenty of drawings, like maybe a thousand photographs, and then there's a process of combing through all of the stuff we've found, picking some uh, kind of a short list, and then thinking about how much time and space we have. And, and, you know, sometimes it's a little bit painful, like there's something you want to draw, but there isn't actually enough room or, or enough time to include it. Um, I find that one of the hardest parts is that kind of editing process. Mm -hmm. It's not something I'm good at, actually. I think that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Often I think we're looking for areas of contrast, too. 
like putting uh, an area where there's a lot of detail next mm. to an area where there's really not much detail. Mm. And that brings more visual excitement to the drawing. Mm -hmm. I think drawing is so much about that. There is a sort of editing that takes place as you're drawing. Mm. And I, I remember watching a documentary about, I think it was like Michelangelo drawing in front of uh, uh, someone doing surgery on, and his drawings of the surgery were so incredible. And they were saying, oh, they're, they're incredible because they're so detailed. But I thought, yes, they're detailed, but he's looking at like a bloody mess and he's deciding that he wants to draw this vein, this artery, and not this other stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of editing that's happening on the spot. Mm -hmm. I think that's what drawing is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yep, you. Um, first, uh, just to comment, I want to say that I love what you guys are doing. Um, everything about it, I mean, I love the finished work. It's really fabulous. And just your process, the way you uh, are integrating life with your work, I think it's really great. And it's also very inspiring because I majored in drawing at art school, but I come from a generation where drawing was always considered a preface to something else. So I love how you're claiming drawing that way. So my Thank very you. mundane question <laughs> is, do you, are you projecting at all? Are you straight off drawing straight off the wall? We, we are projecting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're often projecting, um, especially with a work at this size. It's so difficult to understand how the overall composition is going to work. And so part of the projecting is planning where to put different elements. We might have an idea that this you know, gigantic old growth cedar could go in one area. And we project it up and think, you know, it doesn't really fit there. Mm -hmm. So it's a quick and easy way to decide where to put one element instead of another, mm. try different things. <clears throat> it's a mixture of photos and the sketches that we've collected. So sometimes we're enlarging just a smaller drawing to, you know, it makes it a lot faster. Yeah. Mm. And also, I mean, I think we're, we both, um, we don't want it to look like a photograph. Is what, like we, we often will just put a basic outline in from the projection and then we work into it with ink to transform it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the back. So, Mm -hmm. Because some of the areas of drawing, it looks like we're right up against it, mm -hmm. and others are more distant. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious whether you've actually maintained, as it were, a realistic sense of scale for your thing, or whether you're just playing around. We're trying to play around. Like in, inside this tree, for instance, you'll see the, the ladders and stairs that lead right into it. So again, trying to create that Alice in Wonderland effect. Um, whereas, is, is it that the ladder is small or that the tree is huge? Um, but we do have a four, we're trying to create a sense of foreground, midground, background, which hopefully we'll, you'll start seeing soon because the background will happen last as we do the farthest areas, but it will also be almost more like, a, more like the, the Chinese perspective where it becomes more faint and foggy and less distinct and more low contrast in the distance. Yeah. Yes, Yang. Hi. Um, like when I observe like this area, I yeah. feel you're starting from like a normal uh, fixed perspective. You still mm -hmm. can like, feel like you're perceiving this mm -hmm. area um, mm -hmm. uh, from the reference of Western mm -hmm. uh, linear perspective. Mm -hmm. When it transforms to that part, it becomes a little bit more uh, like poetic and mm -hmm. chaotic, like from the close up at the bottom to mm -hmm. a little bit bird view mm -hmm. on the top. Mm -hmm. um, like so, I'm just. I'm wondering, like, can you talk a little bit about perspectives in like this wall project? Does that mean like when when transfer to that part, it be more internalized, like become inner landscape of your own, mm. rather than like observer of the facts? Good um, question. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. want to start? Matthew? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that we that we really try to do, and we're very excited by is that. Um, you walk into the space and there's no one privileged vantage point. You can't, it's not like most landscape paintings where you're standing in front of it and you can kind of navigate through it in this very particular linear way. Um, this is something that you walk into and you kind of have to choose how you're going to navigate it. And there's a lot of details that you have to get up close to really observe. But then when you stand back, you're seeing different details. Um, but there's not one place from which to do it. That, that sense of immersion, again, is, is something that we're really excited by. And that's always been, I mean, from that first project that we were showing in our house, mm -hmm. there's the sense that you're living in the space. It's not standing in front of the space. We find often uh, children will spot different things than the grown-ups because they're shorter. 
So they'll see, you know, I'll be crawling around on the floor adding all these details that nobody notices but kids, you know. And then the kids probably won't see what's going up on the, on the, on the top. And the perspective hopefully changes a lot on your, depending on your proximity to the wall. Hopefully it'll become a kind of different world from near or far. I don't know if that answers your question well, but I think mean, Matt draws a lot of uh, architecture using more traditional European linear perspectives. And then we both are quite interested in Chinese paintings. So there, I think, is a mixture of uh, kind of these two, two different techniques. Uh, so it changes, hopefully, uh, depending on what area you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and I guess a sense of visual travel as well. Like, you know, walking into the space and you can kind of travel through it with your eyes. Um, and that, that feeling that you're not in the world that you're used to, you're in a different world, and so you have to contend with that, this different place. How, how do you survive there? How do you navigate through it? That's something that I think we love about traveling. It forces you to improvise. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, one of which is a very simple one about uh, fixing the paper the walls. If you mentioned staples, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering how that uh, affects gallery or its uh, wall part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you do it and uh, take it down? The other is that uh, this seems to work more uh, in color on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and one You want to answer part two first? And... Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we've re when we work together, we rarely use color. If we do use color, it's usually just a muted palette. A little um, blue or purple. Cool and it I th down. I think, it's, I think it's partly because color is like the number of variables that you're introducing when you use color is incredible. It's like a huge kettle of worms. I struggle with using color on my own. So, and I think when we're working together, we're really focused on drawing um, as opposed to painting. Um, it's, it's more about this, the, the spectrum of grayscale mm -hmm. that, that makes these works. But you do sometimes feel that it's hard getting back into painting after spending a long time doing this. Definitely. So it requires a different way of thinking, right? It absolutely mm -hmm. is. I have to turn off my drawing brain and turn on my painting brain. And it takes a while to fire that up. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes I think when I start painting after doing a big drawing like this, I use really strong colors because I just want to be flooded with the color. And then that doesn't always make for good paintings. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it's sometimes just a desire to, to experience that, the sensuality of, of paint, mm -hmm. rather than uh, thinking about what the painting can, can use. To answer your question about the walls, the staple holes are so small that when you paint them, you don't even have to patch them. The paint, they just disappear. So it's actually not that bad, Eva. You know, it is, a, it is work. You, you know, we uh, pop out hundreds of staples. And of course, the drawing is, becomes punctured with little holes, especially after it's been reinstalled a few times. But honestly, I kind of like that. I like that the, the paper is like a skin that ages with time. And all the little wounds and, and wrinkles and things that it gathers, it's part of who it, who it is or who it was. It's part of its life story. Um, paper, on one hand, is really resilient. If you keep it dry, it will last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, on the other hand, it's this really fragile thing. It's so thin. Like, this will all go into one tube, and we could, you know, carry it by ourselves on our shoulder. Yeah. Uh, what future projects do you have? All right. Good question. I'm not sure what our next collaboration will be. We're doing Norway. more solo stuff. Yeah, well, the Nordic Artist Center has invited us, us back uh, at an undetermined time in 2018. We're not quite sure what we'll be doing there yet. We're just brainstorming. Our next, you know, I'll be uh, going back to Montreal soon and then uh, traveling to Latvia to uh, exhibit this giant book that took me 18 years and finally finished. And Matt. I'm, I'm moving to Halifax in two weeks um, <laughs> to teach drawing and painting at NASCAD. That just happened. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is our perennial home. No matter where else we've lived, I think yeah. we, you know, 
BC is like such a big part of our psyche and we're always just trying to find ways to get back here. Uh, all, all our families live on, on the West Coast too, so while living in Montreal, we had a bit of a migratory lifestyle going back and forth often. I try to get to BC once a year to see my family, but it's actually not often that I have an exhibition. And uh, yeah, so it's really amazing to be here at Open Space, which was like a legendary place when we were in our, in our art school here. Yeah, it's yeah. the big leagues. And while we're in different places, we correspond. We mail like, <laughs> drawings back and forth, and often that's just personal. It's like uh, having a collection of letters. They don't normally get exhibited, yeah. So do you feel like when you're living in Montreal, do you have that? Do you feel like you're away from home, or do you still feel that because you're in Canada, you're, like, you're at home? I don't know if it's because we're in Canada, but having lived in Montreal such a long time, I, I, do, I do feel it's my adopted home. I mean, I, I speak real French very, quite poorly, and yet the, the community there has really welcomed Matt and I into it, and uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting place for art and music. And it actually, it's like, I think it is kind of still a magnet for artists and musicians from around Canada especially. So, although I don't have my family there, I have a really strong art community that we're, in which I feel really at home. Yeah. yeah, I think home, I think of home as being kind of a constellation of places now. Um, Victoria, Pender Island, I was living on Pender Island for the last two years. Uh, Montreal, of course, for a long time. Uh, I lived in Turkey for a little while. And now Halifax, I don't really know much about that. So yeah, it's, um, there's always going to be a lot of traveling between these places. Yeah, Dave. Hi. Hi. I like the project. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I've been wrestling this one, with this one for years. I've, I've asked this question before. I extend it to you. Uh, when we, uh, often, many of us, when we begin making art as children, it's through our love for nature. Mm -hmm. But so as we move on, as we age, uh, especially where Lumisus is concerned, Sometimes we're confronted that art is the opposite of nature. Do you think that art is a, the antithesis of nature, or how do, you, how do you feel about it? Well, I mean, that's some big questions about what is nature, and um, which is what is um, unnatural or supernatural, uh, some other questions. But I've started to think about kind of everything, either nature is a kind of useless word, or everything is nature, because if you know, um, driving a car is unnatural because humans do it, but ultraviolet light from a star in space is blasting the earth and making a flower grow. That is natural. I mean, where do we make these boundaries? It's usually what is human is called unnatural, but even that is a sort of weird separation for people. Right now, we're having an animal encounter with each other. We are animals. And this is uh, an environment, and even the inside of our head is a, is a mental environment. What's happening in my mental environment affects what I, ha I put on the wall. Um, so all of these things are in exchange. So I actually don't see nature uh, and, and art making in opposition, but of course drawing a picture of a thing is way different than the thing itself. And I think this is something that, for instance, I really admire Brian Youngen, um, I think as a sculptor, He's able to do works with animals that actually help animals. What I can do is make a picture of an animal. It doesn't directly do anything. It just makes someone look at it, and maybe they have an idea. But it's far less uh, clear what the effect actually is of making a picture. Yeah, so that's a different problem, I guess. But I don't think it's so unnatural. I think that the instinct to, to draw, or probably even making things out of clay, some of these things are things that some people have always done. I think it's kind of human nature. It's like speaking and, and uh, it's, it's a kind of communication. Drawing, like playing music, is nonverbal, or like doing math, it's nonverbal, but it is thought. Yeah, I think it's a very human thing. It's a human animal thing to do. Yeah. Nice. What do you got? <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I mean, I was going to interject, but there was no point. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you should mention the finissage, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, bringing us into your world today.